Hello everyone, and thank you so much for having me at The First Magazine. My name is Ntlanta Lakinkosi, and I'm a software developer here in this amazing city called Johannesburg, South Africa. Now here in Joburg, I work for an incredible company called BBD Software Development, where we build bespoke software for a range of organizations in very different industries. At BBD, I work for a unique team known as ATC. I say unique because we're charged with BBD's research and development functions. We do some specialized consulting, but I think the most rewarding part of what we do is the fact that we are also in charge of facilitating training or learning for BBD's 800 plus engineers that are spread all over the world. Now, I also have a big passion for learning and teaching. To fuel this, I'm a lecturer at Wits University's Digital Arts Department. I also strongly believe in community and building the dev community around us. For those purposes, I'm a co-organizer of a monthly meetup called Josie Chairs. I've said a lot to introduce myself, but the most important thing for you to know right now is that my Twitter handle is at nlucky underscore Corsi. Please feel free to tweet me and let me know what you think of this talk. I would really, really appreciate your feedback on this. So while the rest of this conference is filled with incredible, incredible talks that are gonna teach you some incredible stuff, probably things that you even thought you knew, you'll get a brand new perspective today that will forever change your career path. This talk is going to be slightly different. And I say this because in this talk, I'm mostly gonna be telling you about myself and some of the bad, if not weird, decisions I've made over the past few months. Let's get right into it. So a few years ago, I was diagnosed with an illness called narcolepsy. Now, narcolepsy is a sleep disorder that's characterized by excessive sleepiness, excessive and sudden sleepiness, by sleep paralysis, hallucinations, a few things that sound really scary, but it's easily manageable. Around the same time, I was also diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now, this means that when I'm in a setting such as a long conference, a very boring meeting, or a lecture, I'm usually one of two things. Power nap! Mm. Ah, stress nap! Mm. Victory nap! I'm either falling asleep and struggling to stay awake and focused or a speaker will say something or put up a slide that catches my attention and then my imagination just runs wild with me. I get distracted. So when a former colleague of mine, Gergana Young, spoke at a conference here in South Africa, I attended her talk in which she spoke about a lot of very interesting things. But this one slide caught my attention. She put up a tweet uh, recounting how she flew her drone with Node and how she then went on to crash her drone with said Node. First, I thought, how on earth did Jerry fly her drone with Node? And secondly, if she could crash her drone by flying it with Node, I wonder how else I could crash my drone in, very, in various different ways. With that said, today I bring you five ways to kill a perfectly good drone for absolutely no reason, of course. I promised you to tell you a bit about myself and the bad decisions I've made. So we'll start with a very short story. One evening, I was on my way home after a company event. I'm sitting in my Uber and I think I ended up on the site that sells electronics really, really, really cheap. Except the problem here is that these electronic devices that you then buy take about three months to be delivered to Johannesburg. We're quite far from the rest of the world. And what I ended up buying here was a drone. And I'd like to describe the story as saying I accidentally bought a drone because the next morning I had absolutely no recollection of it. Probably the few beers that I'd had that night. So three months later, I'm sitting in the office and a delivery arrives to drone. First thing I think is who on earth bought me a drone? Then I searched through the few sites that I purchased from and I saw in my purchase history that I actually bought a drone. A pretty cool drone at that. The drone that I bought was the SG900S. It had an HD camera mounted on it. It had a, 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 a remote controller so that I could fly it. And I took some really interesting videos with it. But I didn't really have a use for it. In fact, I live in a city that means that I'm never far enough from a police station, a school, or some other kind of property where I'm not actually allowed to fly a drone over. So the only place I could actually fly my drone is in my tiny yard. But I had to find something to do with this drone, otherwise this purchase was useless. 
So I decided that I'm going to hack the story. And as any expert hacker will tell you, the very, very first step to hacking a drone is observation. So I realized that I have to try and figure out how the drone is being controlled so that I can try and replicate that. So first step is to observe how the drone is being flown. And then secondly, try and mimic whatever is flying or controlling the drone. Which means that I had to try and figure out what was happening on the network ports that are involved in flying the drone. When you power on the drone, the drone uh, starts up a Wi-Fi network with absolutely no security. And using an Android app, you can then connect to the drone and then start sending commands through this app. I didn't know much about networking at this point, so I spoke to a few of my colleagues that do. And all of them pointed me to an application called Wireshark. Now, Wireshark is a packet sniffing application that lets you trace or log network activity. This is what a Wireshark trace looks like. It looks scarier than it is. The colorful portions that you see over here, those are the actual individual trace logs um, of, the, of the network activity on some specific network. If you click on one of those, at the bottom of the screen, it then expands to show you information about the data packets that are there. This was incredible, but it didn't actually solve my problem because what I was sniffing was the network activity on the drone itself. So I was seeing what's happening once the drone receives these commands. What I needed to mimic was what was happening when these commands are being sent from this mobile application. There are two ways of flying this drone. I could either use this RC-based controller or I could get an Android application and then try and figure that out. Since I figured that I think I can code, and I think I can code pretty well, I can probably recreate this Android application to do what I wanted to do. So I went onto the Android Play Store and I found this application called T-Packet Capture, which actually logs or traces network activity on your phone. The cool thing about this was that I found it on the Android Play Store, so I didn't have to root my phone or do any weird things to get access to the stuff that I need to trace the network activity. However, when this thing starts up, it spins up a VPN and then blocks network activity from the app to the drone. So the only thing that it would log was connecting to the drone. And once it was connected, the application could no longer send commands to my drone. I didn't get to, to solving my problem this way, but I did realize that this application was sending UDP packets. At this point, I didn't know what UDP packets were, so I went and started doing research on what that is and how I can recreate it. I wrote some code to try and uh, send similar packets. And I realized that I'm now going down a very scary rabbit hole. I was then advised that uh, Apple devices are so in sync that I could easily trace what was happening on my phone um, on an iPhone if I have a MacBook Pro that's actually directly connected to it. Cool. At the time, I didn't have any of these devices, so I asked a friend of mine if I could trace the network activity on his phone. Needless to say, it was an interesting experience, despite me promising him that I would only be uh, tracing data from one application. With that said, I realized here that I'm going down a rabbit hole, and that combined with the fact that the drone that I have is quite big and I wanted to speak up about this and share my experience with people so flying this drone would actually be very dangerous in a conference setting and I generally mostly care about the safety of my audiences so I decided to do something a bit better I decided to simply buy a better more fitting drone so I did some research and I then had I then found a drone that was small enough to fit in the palm of my hand, which means that it's safe to fly in a conference setting. And that also came with a few things that made programming it a bit easier. This drone is called the Parrot Mambo Mini. It's an incredible drone. So it comes with a few extra features that you can buy as um, extendable things. You can get a cannon shooter. So if this conference was in person, I could fly my drone and shoot tiny pellets at my audience uh, but it also comes with a claw so I could fly my drone to go and get myself a beer the cool thing here is that you can exchange all of these devices and just clip them on where the HD camera is currently sitting now this drone has two means of communication you can either fly it with Bluetooth low energy or you can use Wi-Fi since I had spent so much time 
with Wi-Fi and learning about Wi-Fi. And I really wanted this to be a learning experience primarily for me. I decided that I'm going to focus on Bluetooth Low Energy. Now, Bluetooth might sound familiar to most of you. For the people that are a bit older, you'll remember these devices. They were attached to your faces <coughs> in the 2000s. And you all pretended to be in serious business meetings all the time to avoid social interaction, which you're all probably craving now. But for those around my age, we have just come out of infrared technology. And here in Africa, sharing files, uh, be it images or music, was a really, really big thing because we didn't really have streaming services back then. So we were still putting our phones together as if we were using infrared, even though now we, we had this incredible technology called Bluetooth. Now, Bluetooth Low Energy is slightly different from this traditional Bluetooth, and it's often marketed as Bluetooth Smart. And the big differences can be categorized into three things. So firstly, it's still, most, it's still a wireless means of communication, but the three distinct things about it is that firstly, you can power this far better than you could with traditional Bluetooth devices. Organizations can power BLE devices for four years without needing to change the batteries. Secondly, this means that the applications that we use Bluetooth Low Energy for are then slightly different. Bluetooth Low Energy is incredibly powerful for applications that need to send um, non-continuous short bursts of data. So if you're streaming and you can set and, and you can send tiny amounts of that song or of that video over time, this is absolutely an incredible way to do it. If you think of things such as your fitness trackers, your heart rate monitors, your smart devices these all send a chunk of information um just at one time wait a bit and then send another one and so it only uses the power when that uh, information is being transferred but the coolest thing for me is that you can now have up to 20 simultaneous connections through bluetooth low energy now this in contrast with the traditional maximum of seven simultaneous connections is absolutely incredible for me. Of course, these thresholds are affected by manufacturers, by the hardware and the software that's actually running on these things. A bit more about me. I come from a game development background. I studied game design and the tool that I use the most in my studies is Unity 3D. This is my hammer. I hit absolutely everything with it. If I need to build anything for my side projects, this would be my go-to. I've built applications, I've built websites, or tried to build websites using Unity 3D. But early last year, I started working with two incredible web developers, one of whom is a Google developer expert in web technologies, Michael Fraser. And I feel like through working with these two incredible web developers, I've sort of developed a new weapon, an X, if you will. And this X is called JavaScript. I love JavaScript and its idiosyncrasies so much that it has become my weapon of choice and I build everything with JavaScript. This project was no different. I decided that I would go and build this entire thing using JavaScript. My research pointed me to two libraries, Noble and Blino. Noble stands for Node Bluetooth Low Energy and Blino stands for Bluetooth Low Energy for Node. I know software developers are absolutely horrible at naming things. We think we are good at it, but we're absolutely horrible at it. Anyway, these two do almost opposites of each other. Noble is used when you're trying to build a central module that will then connect to Bluetooth peripheral devices. And Blino is used for when you're implementing a peripheral device such as a heart rate monitor. For our application, we had to use Noble because we are building a central command station, if you will, that will connect to the drone and fly the drone and send commands to the drone. Bit more about myself. I spent some time in the South African Air Force and the knowledge I, I have about, fly, uh, about planes finally came to good use. So when you're flying anything, the movements can be described in three main um, terms. The first is a roll. This is when you're flying, the pilot will simply tilt the plane to the left and hope that the wind carries them in the correct direction. And a roll is when, well, that's a roll. A yaw is when you're almost spinning the car on the road. So that sort of movement, that rotation about the Y axis, I think. And you then have a pitch, which is when the pilot basically points the plane up 
and hopes that the wind will carry the plane to where it needs to be. Armed with that knowledge, decided we're ready to go and we need to build this thing. So at number five of five ways to kill a perfectly good drone is to fly it with no plane. Research showed me that in order to send commands to this new drone that I had, I had to generate this XML uh, spreadsheet or this XML structure rather. And I then had to send this entire XML to the drone, which has, and this XML has the different movements that I would like the drone to do. This is quite a lot to do. And I really didn't feel like generating all this XML every time I wanted to. But because I'm using this incredible friend called JavaScript that I had, I did what most JavaScript developers do. If you're looking for something, just type what that thing is, add JS to it, and chances are there's a library that does that exact same thing. I was working with a mini drone, so I typed in a mini drone JS, and I came across this library, which did a few things, but the most important part that I needed here was that this library allowed me to give it three strings, and it would then generate the XML for me. So I could create that entire XML structure from one line of code. What this meant is that in less than 10 lines of code, I could connect to my drone and, and actually get the drone to take off with less than 10 lines of code. This was absolutely incredible. Around the same time, my former colleague, Mike Heza, gave a talk titled, What Should the Web Do? And I think this is a fundamentally important question for us to, to discuss as, as web developers. Because while we're thinking about this, web users already know what they want the web to do. They want the web to do absolutely everything. And they want to, and they wanted to do everything today. The good news here is that web manufacturers or browser manufacturers rather are coming to the forefront by building core things that we need, core tools that we need into the browsers themselves. But that said, and armed with that knowledge, I decided at number four to fly the drone using JavaScript straight from the browser without running any server whatsoever. Now, this also then started getting me to think about how I'm going to connect with my browser, connect with my drone straight from my browser. And then I was introduced to Web Bluetooth. Now, Web Bluetooth arms or equips our browser with the ability to connect to Bluetooth devices and communicate with these Bluetooth devices. This means that we can now start interacting with all sorts of um, applications and devices around us that we couldn't actually do before using wireless communication. So, because open source is such an important thing, such an important part of our dev ecosystem, I went online and started doing a bit more research about other people who had done something similar. I came across this user on GitHub, Peter O'Shaughnessy, who in his library had one specific script that I was interested in. It's called drone v jones very aptly named. So I took the script and I reworked it. I rewrote some of the stuff, his classes, and I made it work for me. And based on this drone, I create, or based on his script, I have created two new scripts called Drone, con drone Connection Management to facilitate the connection um, to the drone, and then Drone Control, which then exposes the key um, controls that I need in order to fly my drone. With these two scripts imported, this means that I can write code that looks like this, where I can simply say drone.move left to make my drone move left, drone.move right to make it move right, etc. And now, with this in place, decided at number three that one of the coolest ways I could fly this drone was by making it mimic other devices. Now, this is because I have a big fascination for human computer interaction and studying human computer interaction. Uh, co human computer interaction rather. And this is because I truly believe that if we reevaluate and rethink about how we interact and communicate with computers, we can create some meaning, very meaningful experiences that have great applications such as rehabilitation, education, and some really fundamentally important things in society. We can give technology that bleeding edge that it is craving so much. Now, the interesting thing here is that developers can't seem to agree on what the best approach is. Native, do you go hybrid, do you go web? When you're building even within the web ecosystem itself, 
it's a war as to which library is better. The good news here is that we have the W3C, whose mission is to lead the web to its fullest potentials, and they aim to do this by developing web standards. What this means is that based on these web standards, browser manufacturers can then build these core tools and functionality that we need so that we don't have to debate about which framework or library does it better. The Mozilla Web Docs, I believe, document these quite well. I consider it a very good source of truth as to what is available, what is in, experimental, uh, in the experimental stage, what has been deprecated. And so this is where I go to try and figure out what is available to me from the different browsers. Now here on these web APIs, one of them caught my attention. At the time, it was still experimental, but this is called the Generic Sensors API. And what this does is that it gives you direct access to your phone's sensors, accelerometers, ambient light sensors, um, all of these sensors that we carry around in our pockets every single day that read incredible information and we can then write code to directly tap into these sensors straight from the browser. To check if this browser that is running your code supports any of these, you can use standard JavaScript ways to see if it's in the window, if the function actually exists. And if you want to start reading, as you can appreciate that this is not an easy task, but the code is actually quite easy. All you have to do is write sensor let sensor equals new accelerometer. But to start reading this data, you simply call sensor.start. To stop reading it, sensor.stop. And then you can even create an event listener so that you can start acting as and when you get all of this data. This means that I could write code that when my phone is picked up, it would sense this and then start sending commands to my drone based on my phone's orientation. Now, a key part of building good modern browser is by creating a good developer experience. And the Chrome browser is a good example of what a good developer experience use, looks like in a browser. So the Chrome DevTools allow you to connect your phone and then start inspecting what, exactly what's happening in your phone. You can see the, the browser tab itself and you can actually see the data that's coming in and out. So as I move my phone, the accelerometer data is shown as XYZ coordinates, which means that as and when I keep moving my phone, I can represent these using numbers. I can then map these numbers directly to drone's movements, such as moving forward, backwards, upwards, and down. What this looks like is this. <clears throat> so when I tilt my phone up, the drone takes off, lean my phone forward, the drone moves forward, taking it back will move the drone back, and putting my phone back in the original position simply lands the drone. Now, as you can see, this is almost a guaranteed way of crashing a perfectly good drone. Now, with that said, with that said, at number two, decided, why don't I fly this drone using hand gestures? Another story might be my last. I was at another company event at the office, sitting at the bar, and I honestly don't remember who but this person came up to me and gave me a box, said some words that I don't remember at all, but all I remember was that I was given a box. This is what that box was. The box had something called a leap motion sensor, which is an incredible, incredible tool that I've been wanting to play with for quite a while. And I think I mentioned it to someone and that's why they came and gave me this box. So the leap motion sensor, what it does is that it maps the different joints on your bone, on your arms, and your hands to give you a digital representation of what is seeing of your hands which means that i can then map all of the data that i'm getting about the different points in my hands i can get that information as coordinates and i can then start mapping that information to different drone movements and what that looks like is this so when i put my hand um, on top of the camera it starts sensing it and as i move my hand you can see that the drone starts mimicking or well, almost mimicking what my hand is doing, which is quite difficult, particularly doing this demo for a virtual conference because the drone will fly out of range and the camera won't be able to see it anymore. So if this would have worked really incredibly well if this conference was in person. 
but you can see that the drone is still following my every movement and now I can start doing things such as rotating the drone whereas in the previous demo I could just move the drone in the different directions so the drone here is uh, out of view but I think you get to see the, the, the gist of it and the cool thing here is that about this drone is that because it fits in the palm of my hand I can more or less safely land it anywhere and just catch it now I have a 10 year old brother significantly younger than me and he frustrates me because all of the things all of his traits that frustrate me I realize are traits that I also have myself so I, I, I often see him as a reflection of who I am now I've been wanting to get him interested or to, to, to start getting him playing with tech and in doing that I learned a lot about how non-technical people view technology there's this idea that technology is this foreign concept particularly here in Africa it is this incredible amazing thing that does all of these things and is only for smart people now I believe that everyone can do something with technology I believe that anyone can do incredible things to better their lives and to improve anything that they do on a daily basis and I realized that the only way we can show people how the only way that we can make technology accessible in and of itself is if we change the language and change how we talk about technology. So I believe that it's important for us to put technology in the context of people's lives themselves. And the easiest way to do this is by taking devices or taking things that people see every single day and showing them how technology can bring them to life and get them to do things that they've never been able to do before. With that said, at number one of ways to kill a perfectly good drone, fly it with fruits, right? Any fruit that you have for that matter. Let me show you this. So as you can see in my hands, I've got four bananas. I've got four because when I recorded this demo, I hadn't had breakfast, so I ended up eating one. But what I'm doing there is that I'm actually plugging in all of the fruits into some wires. Now, I'm only using three fruits to control the actual drone. And then there's the final fruit, um, my final banana that I'm controlling to a special wire. As you can see, I'm holding it up high because it's very, very special. And I'll tell you why. But these bananas are then connected to a chip. I'll tell you what the chip does and what the chip is in a moment. But once we have all of these different fruits connected, all we have to do is start up this application, this small JavaScript application that I've written. And you can see that as I touch the, the, the different fruits, the drone moves in different directions. Yes, what you just saw was a drone flip. I know, right? It's incredible. But again, move it to my left. When I touch it, it flips. I know that it goes out of frame, but believe me, the drone flipped. When I said this to my friend, he didn't believe me. So I decided to re-record that part of the demo. So what I've done now is that I took the drone and I put it on the chair. So again, I need to hold this super fruit. And you can see when I touch the banana in the middle, it does a backflip. Touching either fruit on either side makes the drone move in the different um, uh, directions. Final flip for the demo gods. And there we go. Again, I can safely land this drone in the palm of my hand. So if you notice on the table, I have a tiny chip that all of these things are connected to. The board that I'm using there is called the Make Making. So I came across this board, I think back in 2013, um, when we had a digital arts festival. And that's when I, I, I was introduced to this board. What it does is that the Make Making simulates a, a, a keyboard by simply closing the circuit between any of the pins that are there, such as the left, right, and your keyboard pins. If you close those pins with the ground pin, it simulates the keyboard. How it actually works is that we are organic matter, and all organic matter, including fruits, vegetables, and all things that occur naturally, I guess, we all have water. And that water can actually conduct some electricity. Which means that we're not great conductors of electricity, but we can actually conduct some electricity. So do fruits, such as banana. So what I've done there is that when you touch the, the, the special fruit that I keep holding on to, that is connected directly to the ground pin. And when you touch that fruit, 
while you're holding that fruit and you touch any of the others, you're actually letting current run through you straight to the ground pin. Which means that we can write code that listens or tries to read what this pin is. And as soon as that voltage gets dropped because I'm now trying to ground it, we can then assume that that fruit or that pin has been touched by someone. This Makey Makey board is absolutely incredible, but it's quite expensive. Here in South Africa, I think I could I, I bought it for over a thousand rands, which is I would say probably around sixty seventy dollars, um, US dollars. So I then decided that I need to recreate this using the cheapest board I could find. So I found an Arduino Uno board, which I got for about I think less than ten dollars, and using that board, I wrote very basic C code. Uh, build some very basic circuitry to try and recreate this in the cheapest way I knew how to. I've documented this in an article, so if you go to dev.to um, and my username Lakingosi, if if you're interested in building your own custom controller using absolutely anything that can conduct electricity, I have a step-by-step -step guide here as to how you can do that yourself. Now, every time I speak to people about all of these interesting things, that I'm doing with drones, flying them with banana, flying them with Twitter, which I couldn't do today because this conference has now gone virtual. All of these interesting things, all of these cool, crazy, useless things that I do, I'm always asked, but why? The answer is simple. In our industry, we have to constantly learn. We have to constantly learn and constantly grow because technology is growing every single day. The only way that we can stay on top of our game by continuously learning. I've got ADHD, so I need to find interesting ways to keep grabbing my attention and to make things fun for myself. And the best way for me to do this is by playing. So I play in order to learn. And if there's only one thing that you take away from this talk, is that you should always keep playing. Because when you play, you learn. And when you learn, you grow. It's an incredible way of getting people around you to be involved in your learning as well. And that peer-to-peer -peer learning, being able to speak to people and asking them for help, asking them about networking, because I don't know any networking. Not only is it improving my technical abilities because I now learn things, but I'm also now forced to interact with and learn from other people, which is, in my opinion, the best way of learning. So keep playing. And thank you so much for having me at this day first.